Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, it is so wonderful to see you here today. This is uh, one of the highlight events of the year. It's very exciting. Uh, my name is Risa Galyubov. I am Dean of the Law School, and I'm delighted to welcome you here, um, first time visitors and longtime friends, students, faculty, and staff, to this lecture with our 2024 Thomas Jefferson Foundation Medalist in Law. Before I introduce the Honorable Roger Gregory, I want to thank a few people who have uh, made this event possible. Rebecca Claff and Laurel Owens and our events team who organized today's events, as well as everyone on the communications, law IT, building services, and janitorial teams for everything they do to make this all look effortless. Uh, thank you as well uh, for the special guests who have joined us today, Mrs. Velda Gregory, uh, Judge Gregory's wife, uh, as well as Patricia Connor, who was the longtime clerk of uh, the Fourth Circuit, who is here with us today. Finally, uh, it is my great privilege to introduce the Honorable Roger L. Gregory, the 2024 recipient of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Medal in Law. Judge Gregory is a path-breaking public servant and son of Virginia who has served on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals since 2001 after a distinguished career in private practice. After attending segregated schools through the 11th grade, Judge Gregory was in the first class of students to graduate from Petersburg's Integrated High School in 1971, almost two decades after the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education. A first-generation college student, Judge Gregory attended Virginia State College, now Virginia State University, ultimately graduating summa cum laude, and then he attended the University of Michigan for law school, graduating in 1978, and for which we forgive him. <laughs> in 1982, after practicing at law firms in Detroit and Richmond, Judge Gregory formed the, formed the law firm of Wilder and Gregory with L. Douglas Wilder, who later became governor of Virginia uh, and was himself a pathbreaker, the first black governor elected in any state of the United States. After building a successful corporate litigation practice in Richmond, Judge Gregory began his career in the federal judiciary in 2000 when he was nominated by President Bill Clinton to serve on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit based in Richmond. The Senate did not initially act on the nomination and President Clinton made a recess appointment. Judge Gregory joined the appellate court in December of 2000. Just a few months later, President George W. Bush re-nominated Judge Gregory to the Fourth Circuit, and this time he was quickly confirmed to his seat by a near unanimous vote. And he remains the only person appointed to a federal appellate judgeship by presidents of two different parties. In his more than two decades on the court, Judge Gregory has built a reputation as a formidable jurist who brings his remarkable intellect and legal acumen to bear in every case he hears, along with a deep-seated humanity and commitment to the rule of law. Quote, at bottom, one commentator said, Judge Gregory has a leveling up jurisprudence that seeks to ensure that the least well-off are afforded the same legal protections as the most privileged in our society. Judge Gregory has served as the Fourth Circuit's chief judge from 2016 to 2023, leading the court's administrative operations through a particularly challenging era for leadership of any institution. Not that I would know from personal experience. <laughs> he has also volunteered countless hours with numerous civic organizations, having led or served on the boards of the Industrial Development Authority of Richmond, Virginia Commonwealth University, the Black Mu History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia, the Old Dominion Bar Association, and the Friends Association for Children, among many others. No recitation of Judge Gregory's many substantive contributions to the Fourth Circuit, its jurisprudence, and its people would be complete without noting his role as a pathbreaker on the court. When Judge Gregory joined the Fourth Circuit, he broke the judicial color line in a jurisdiction that, at the time, had the largest proportion of black residents of any federal appellate court in the country. And he later became the circuit's first black chief judge as well. The symbolism of Judge Gregory's service is physical as well as personal. His chambers are located in Richmond, the former capital of the Confederacy, in a building that once housed Jefferson Davis's executive office. 
this brief recitation of Judge Gregory's accomplishments remains incomplete, and I can't possibly do it all justice, no pun intended. Uh, as such, it surely fails to capture the scope of his contributions to the people of our commonwealth and our nation and the humanity and great care with which he approaches the litigants in each of his cases. As Judge Gregory himself once said, quote, your service is important. It is what you do for others that really lasts, what you build in the hearts of other people, that is what eternal things are. Judge Gregory's own legacy will surely be an eternal one. His love of country, his life of service to others, and his work to advance freedom, equality, and justice for all Americans are models for me and I know for all of us. So without further ado, I am honored to present you the 2024 Thomas Jefferson Foundation Medalist in Law, the Honorable Roger L. Gregory. Dean Galyabuff, uh, thank you so much for your wonderful words. Um, uh, I must say that when I received the letter that I was to be the recipient of this incredible medal, uh, I'm glad that uh, I was at a level ground because I was almost about to faint. And that's not hyperbole. It really was. I mean, uh, my heart was, uh, first of all, it, it was a mixture of incredible humility and just retrospective and it is an incredible honor. I just want to thank you and the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, University of Virginia, and the law school for bestowing such a great uh, honor to me. And times like this, that the mystic chords of memory swell and they touch, and many chords and rivers of times and, and all those things, a river runs right through it. Uh, parents who, uh, as the Dean alluded to, who worked very hard, tobacco factory, and, and being the first, not only to go to college, but to graduate from high school, then college, then law school. It's uh, really a tribute to them. And uh, I wish that they could be here to see this, uh, but somehow I think they know. Uh, so, you know, it's fainting, you know, it, it, these things come like, it's so amazing. It's, you know, an eclipse was this week. <laughs> Those kind of things kind of come, you know, and this is an incredible week, you know. It's, of course, it's Thomas Jefferson's birthday, Saturday, I believe, the 13th of April. Uh, uh, tomorrow, the 12th, is the day that Dr. King was arrested in Birmingham, and he sat down and penned a letter. Penned a letter we now know as the the Birmingham letter from the jail. Uh, the ninth was the last day of the Civil War. Lee surrendered his army to Grant and Appomattox. And also on the 12th was the first day of the war down in Charleston, South Carolina, fired on Fort Sumter. So it is an incredible week in our history and certainly in my personal honor to be here, particularly here at Mr. Jefferson School. And this school we know is important for all of the things that the president accomplished. On his tomb, he wanted to be known by the Declaration of Independence, right? Declaration in terms of uh, statute, in terms of religious freedom, and the University of Virginia. And thank you for forgiving me, Dean. Uh, I'll forgive you also for Michigan having to share with you on the rankings lately. And <laughs> you're on the upside. <laughs> but that's okay. When I was there, <laughs> we were two or three. It was always Harvard, Yale, Michigan, or Harvard, Michigan, Yale. But it's, it's nice. And, uh, but it didn't take me reading the magazine to know how great this university is in law school, I know that. I know that from the, not only just reputation, but I've seen your work and your work has helped me with my work. Some great law clerks. Matter of fact, that's how we met. She's a working dean. We met, we were on a panel of constitutional law in Williamsburg. She was waxing, of course, eloquently in constitutional law. I was taking notes. But she was talking to me about a, a student she had and she was absolutely right and he was a very great, great law clerk. 
And speaking of law clerks, you know, and it's, it's a, a blessing that keeps on going uh, because it, uh, on Friday, I am going to, yeah, right after I get the award at the Rotunda, I'm going to do a live feed to the Baltimore Federal Courts. One of my law clerks is a judge. His investiture. So I'm here and couldn't be there. But I thought technology would help me get there. And uh, so but it, it really is in terms of part of the story. Um, and uh, another clerk who's uh, on the Seventh Circuit, uh, Court of Appeals, who clerked for me. And I went to her investiture in Chicago. So I'm saying this to say that if anything, life is about a gift that keeps on giving. And I've been blessed to have a lot of gifts and a lot of contributions from people who helped me. And I'm glad to pass that rope of destiny to them that they might climb. Because to me, that's what it's all about. And my lovely wife is here with me. Uh, I can tell you this, it, uh, uh, I have three daughters. Uh, so I didn't go to University of Virginia, but a lot of my money came to University of Virginia. <laughs> my middle daughter, went to the uh, University of Virginia, and it was so nice singing the good old song, in the rain, playing Georgia Tech, uh, playing the football. It was really nice, and uh, she had a wonderful experience, an English major, and just really cool. And, and my uh, older daughter uh, passed nearly two years ago, and uh, Belle and I have been married almost, what, nine years? And you know what, what the real test of love is in terms of how you deal with the things that you don't know that will happen. And we are, we are my two granddaughters my, my, uh, uh, live with us and we're raising her and she's grandma as much if not more than I'm grandpa. And, and I, I love her for that and I want to just shout out that she's been a wonderful love and companion and just right there with me. So I share this with her and all the memories. Now I'm get on. Now this is a talk, not a lecture, and it's not a job talk either, because I know how you, I know how in the law schools you have job talks. This is not, so there will be no footnotes to this. <laughs> it's a talk. But I thought about constitutionalism, the whole idea of adhering to constitutional principles and ideals. The good thing about that is also the bad thing about that. The good thing is that obviously anybody who's a lawyer, particularly particularly a judge, and I'm sworn to be so, is an adherent to the Constitution. It's required. The bad news is everybody has a different view of what that means and how to interpret it. And I think, and of course, oh, let me say this. I'm a federal judge. I have no political opinion. Did I, did I say that just in case? I have no political opinion. I don't know where they hide these things. <laughs> no, but I don't. I, but I do have a view about the Constitution a bit, and I make no statement about any case that's before me in the Fourth Circuit, or very likely to come before me in that detail. So, with that caveat, uh, because we're going to have a Q and A, and everything else is open to talk about. And the dean is, and, and it was not scripted because she hasn't given me a clue as what she's going to ask me. So it's <laughs> it's all live. It's all live. But anyway, but constitution uh, constitutionalism. It's been inherent, and that has been a problem has, has perplexed us since the beginning of the republic. What does it mean? And in fact, who are we the people? And in fact, there's some questions now in terms of jurisprudence and question, one, perhaps one of the first steps in finding historical analogs might be to determine who are people that are protected under those rights in the Constitution and the Amendments and the Bill of Rights. And so we have to go back looking for analogs as to who we the people are. And I can tell you that people that look like me would not be so if you were textualists or originalists and all of those things. So, but we, 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 we try to, we toil with trying to get it right. And nothing I say is disparaging at all to anyone because it's difficult, it's tough. But as John Kennedy said about space, we go to, to the moon because it is difficult. Because that's what Americans do, because it is difficult. We grapple with these things because they are difficult. They should not be grounds to divide us. Instead, they should make us stronger to understand our Constitution. De Tocqueville said, 
one of my favorite. He wrote that book, uh, American Democracy, right? Uh, uh, and he made so much, so many observations, but he said Americans don't do a whole lot of dialogue about things. We don't talk about things well. In other words, almost like from a kid, we don't play well in the sandbox when it comes to talking about our constitution and what it means and, and are we talking about originalism or textualism or the text or what it means. Um, so I tell you, just take a, just a, a moment to tell you in a sense why that might be in terms of the situation. Our framers were genius. They were. And what they excelled in the most was this, their objective to make us a powerful nation that could carry on interstate and international commerce, be strong enough to protect us against our foreign enemies, put together machinery that could make us the gold standard of the world, they were successful. There's no question about it. They put an incredible architects for that. But what they did not do was intentional. They made a compromise because, face it, about 27 of the 55 were slaveholders. And they knew the only way to make this thing work was to give up some of the revolutionary ideals that they had in the, in the Declaration of Independence. They needed that. They needed, so they, so they did. You notice that, for example, from a, the anti-democratic things, give an example, there's no right to vote in the Constitution. And think about it, on, Jan on September the 17th, 1787, they were finished. There was no Bill of Rights. It was Jefferson who was in Paris. He wrote, I think he made a letter probably for him and said, Little Jimmy, what did you, that's Madison. <laughs> <laughs> what did y'all do down, out there? Every people, whoever they are, need a Bill of Rights against the government. What are you talking about? And they wrote a correspondence, it wasn't text either. You can imagine how long a letter took to get from Paris to Virginia, but he did brilliant writing. The two of them were titans. And, and think about it, and this is in defense of Madison. Madison, you probably don't know this, he wasn't opposed to the Bill of Rights in terms of protecting rights from the federal government. His thing was, if anything, we need a Bill of Rights to protect people from state governments. That was his position. He said, no, that's the real danger. You know why? Because he realized Shays' Rebellion. You know, those things like that. And, and Shays' Rebellion and, and the states were doing things like this, more importantly. Yeah, that was against the people, populist people. But, for, uh, but for, for in terms of the states, they weren't paying off their debts. And these bondholders were coming to the states and saying, where's our money? And they said, we don't have it. Oh, yeah, you want some money? Here, we just printed this in our capital right here. Take this. And, now give me, on, this is the genius of it. When they wrote the Constitution, the preamble, remember they said, right, we the, we the people, do hereby ordain, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. They weren't talking about the justice we're talking about, and I would debate any historian about that. What they were talking about is, we are tired of these states closing their courts to people trying to justly get debts paid. The states were saying, I'm sorry, there's no court today. Or we're not going to, or that. no, we're not going to pay off that bond. We're not going to pay off that debt. We're not going to do that. They were angry about that. And when they say establish justice, it was literal. No, we're going to make sure it's established that our courts will be open and federal judges that are like-minded like us are gonna help us ensure that. But the beauty is they didn't detail what they were doing, they just call it what? Established justice. So it was broad enough to later to be what justice might become. But so and I say that to my originalist friends. If you wanna talk about it as an originalist, then you'll be stuck right there. It was against this, it was to protect against the states closing courts. But it had to mean more than that. It had to mean more than that. But that was one of the other problems. And I, and I move on in terms of, but that's the kind of thing. Uh, Madison said, look, uh, we need to protect ourselves from mankind's natural inclination for mutual animosities. They were afraid of the people. 
That's why it was anti-democratic, in a sense. Madison said the best way to, to sort of neutralize the people was to make government big. They didn't want local government. That's why, you know, we have districts. Each state has right district, congressional districts. There's nothing in the Constitution that requires that. You could have one congressional district and have all of your members chosen from that one district. And it wouldn't offend Baker versus Carr either because everybody's in that district. So you're not, I mean, so they, it was very anti-democratic. For example, a lot of people didn't know this. You couldn't vote for the Senate. And what do, what do senators do? They confirm judges. So in terms of democratic, the people could not vote for the people who would pick confirmed federal judges. And for example, can anybody name any piece of legislation that could get passed by the people's house that the Senate doesn't also pass? The answer is zero, right? So even that, it cut off the democratic process because you couldn't pick the senator and the senator couldn't neutralize anything that the people's house did because it required them to also pass it. Yeah, it was very anti-democratic. They knew what they were doing because they just could not have these people who they believe had the impulses of being uh, motivated by passion and interest. If for them it was a battle of passion and interest, versus reason and deliberation. Don't forget they were motivated by whom? Plato. Plato was dis, uh, you read the Republic, he was, he was despondent, he was depressed. His mentor Socrates had been executed and uh, the, the fifth century uh, democracy of per, uh, Pericles had failed because people started exaggerating their importance and putting themselves ahead of the interests of the people. So it failed. So he was writing from that sense. Matter of fact, he said ought to be the learned. That's what he came up as the philosopher king ought to be the leader. And they believed that. Not from a, from a, uh, a mean spirit, but because of, they were patronizing. If, this work, if it's gonna work, people who've been educated. For example, electoral college, right? No direct uh, election of the president. Now, why do, you, why do they call it a college? How many people you think went to college in 1787? They used their language. It is the college that will elect the president. And well, it's a check on the people because just in case the people get drunk with their passions, we have a check on it. And people are beginning to understand that without any reference to anything going on, they had no idea that it was so singular as to who actually says it's the president of the Senate who announces that. And you see what I'm saying? Very anti-democratic. We had to grow into this. So people who are originalists, I, I love to debate them that. I respect their view, but it doesn't hold water from a historical standpoint in terms of if you're gonna be stuck with the original intent. And the textualists the same way. How do you, how do you, how do you use the text to describe established justice? without any context. As a matter of fact, text without context is pretext. So I think it is a living document. It's one that has to be multiple. And think about this, what they said, for example. Now, I love this one. You all know who Justice Story was. He served with John Marshall. As a matter of fact, he probably was the most scholarly person ever to serve on the Supreme Court. Awesome scholar. Uh, he wrote commentaries on the, the Constitution. This is what he said nearly 200 years ago. The Constitution must be interpreted with contextual sensitivity to changing circumstances so that it imposes reasonable requirements in such circumstances. How in the world 200 late, years later can you say, we should not have an expansive view of in terms of changing time when 200 years ago he was saying that. A contemporary. No, we have to adjust to those times. So again, constitutionalism is a blessing because we adhere to the Constitution, but it can be a curse if we engage in distorted constitutionalism. I'm not saying you know, originalists are distorting it, but I'm saying it led, historically it did, John Calhoun, he took the very words of Thomas Jefferson, penned brilliantly and eloquently in the Declaration of Independence, and came up with it to support slavery. 
The whole basis for the doctrines of interposition and nullification was based on that. When it comes in the course of human events, that when someone is threatening your rights to, to interest in property in human beings, called chattel slavery, then you have a right, matter of fact, a duty. You see how you can paraphrase that, and that's what they did. As a matter of fact, they said, no, we can interpose our state law, and we can nullify federal law. And he took it from the American revolutionary ideas. That's why the anti-federalists were upset. They said, wait a minute, this Constitution doesn't speak to the revolutionary ideas. What are you doing here? So what I'm saying is nothing magical about constitutionalism if you distort it in the sense that it's boxed in something that doesn't breathe and doesn't live and it doesn't respond to, in my view, a generation in that. So we go on fast to Tocqueville. Again, brilliant. One of my favorite quotes. He said that America's greatness does not lie in it being more enlightened than other nations. Its greatness lies in that it has the ability to repair its faults. What a phrase. No, that's the great, we have the ability. The Constitution is broad enough, they use broad enough language that we could grow into a meaning that fulfills justice. Grow in a sense that all of us could be a part of this. It was not stuck there. They wanted to make a new nation. What was necessary they substituted and gave up human rights in order to make it work. But I can't see how in the world you can justify 250 years later we still have to be there knowing that that was what was given up. But anyway, but so, but we tried though. The Chief Justice Tawney tried. Let's stop this ship from coming. And he used the most vile words you could use. So he said, how do you do that? We have to show that the enslaved people never were meant to be a part of anything in the words of the Declaration or in the preamble. He said, but it is too clear for dispute that the enslaved African, and this is in the Supreme Court in his opinion, the enslaved race were not intended to be included and form no part of the people who framed and adopted this declaration. Because his idea was this, the framers were too, too honorable and they had too much integrity to say all men are created equal and talk about we the people and, and say that and still include the enslaved people. They must have, he concludes in his circular reasoning to keep them honest that they didn't, clearly couldn't have meant this subset were human. Because if you do that, then you have to admit that they were deliberately lying. That's what his, that's what in the constant you read. You gotta read, I don't know about the CRT stuff, but if you have to read this to understand where we were, to help better understand where we need to go if we're gonna make this ring thing work for everybody. And I love the Constitution. I toil it every day and try my best to get equal justice to everyone. But we cannot be stuck and put our heads in the sand to say that there's nothing talismanic about these words unless it's in the heart and an idea of believing what freedoms and justice are. And lastly, I get out of history a little bit of this last thing. March the 2nd, 1861, June 15, 1865. March 2nd, 1861, June 15, 1865, I shudder to think about those two dates. Let me tell you what it is. March 2, 1861, the Congress of the United States, having required a two-thirds majority in each house, transmitted to the states for a proposal of the 13th Amendment, that 13th Amendment would have protected slavery against any federal interference. June 15, 1865, Congress having also reached a two-thirds majority in each house, submitted to them the 13th Amendment. Oh, did I tell you the first one was never ratified? And they were proposed to end slavery. That's the 13th Amendment we didn't have, no. That's how close we were with ensconcing slavery in our Constitution. 
And what happened, unfortunately, really, is a war with over 600,000 casualties. It took blood to change that course between those two. I call it 51 months. 51 months, that was the difference in terms of what they had submitted to the states and what would have been the 13th Amendment and is not. So I'm saying this does not, as Dr. King says, things don't change but by time. Time is a neutral force. Nothing rolls on the course of inevitability. It takes people with heart and courage and a belief in a constitution that has to fulfill its meaning. That Jefferson's word did include everybody. It's just that we were not doing so. And we can't get that twisted in the point that, you know, it's like arithmetic. Figures don't lie, but liars figure. So you have to look behind those figures because our country and our promise is too great. The mission is too important. The things that we lead helpfully globally in the great country that was put together through the Constitution made a difference. And I move on. Slaughterhouse cases. This is post 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Oh, guess what? Oh, there are no citizen rights that come from the federal government. It all comes from states. Oh, you'll have to go back to Mississippi to find out whether or not they're going to be right. You have to go to Georgia, Alabama, whatever. These are the newly freedmen going back after 1876, the Tilden Hayes election. Can you imagine that? Where are you back writing the same thing? Again, even these amendments did not change anything because their hearts didn't change. And moving on, and, and the 18, uh, the civil rights cases are even worse in terms of they struck down a federal law that would have protected blacks voting and said, no, there's no protection. States are the rights to vote. There's no federal right there. And it's almost like a formula for violence that, well, you know, it's constitutional. You read the opinion. Well, if you go to vote, we'll protect the right to vote, but if on your way somebody beats you up or something happens to you, that's a state crime, and you'll have to go to state courts to vindicate those rights. These are Supreme Court opinions. And then, of course, Plessy comes along in 1896, separate but equal, that's the definition of the 14th Amendment. All these were victories as opposed, you see what I'm saying? None of these things really changed until hearts changed upon a broader view of constitutionalism and giving the documents some real meaning. And people don't know about Williams versus Mississippi. That's the one in 19, uh, 1898 or so, said that uh, states could change their constitution and counting jelly beans and the grandfather clause and the poll tax was all appropriate. And Virginia did. And your colleague here, A.E. Dick Howard, worked on that in terms of changing that in, the, in 1971. Uh, and around the world, he has done so, because people have pride in our Constitution. The question is, do we still have pride in our Constitution? Do we still want it to breathe? That's the question. It's not our enemies. We're not defeated because our enemies defeat us. We are defeated if we surrender. And we cannot surrender our constitutional process. Uh, thing that were too hard fought, too many people went on. And I conclude with one of my favorite justices, and that's Justice Brennan. Justice Brennan, I thought he just made the Constitution live in so many ways. I love his dissent in McCleskey Kemp. Yeah, how much is too much justice? In dissent. But this is what he said. He said, our Constitution is a charter of human rights and human dignity. It is a bold commitment by a people to the ideal of dignity protected through law. And the vision is deeply moving. And he says, as a judge, I love this. I approach my responsibility to interpret the Constitution in the only way I could. As a 20th century American concerned about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and it's what it means to us in our time. The genius of the Constitution rests not in any static meaning it may have had in a world that is dead and gone, but in the adaptability of its great principles to cope with current problems and present needs. Justice Brennan. It's a great contribution that President Eisenhower gave 
in my view, to the nation to put, and of course, Justice Brennan was a recess appointee like me. <laughs> Did I say that? Did I say that? And also Eisenhower put Earl Warren on the court, and he was also a recess appointee like me. So I, mean, I was in good company. But I'd say that, uh, and then Cardozo, of course, went on in the nature of the judicial classic, nature of judicial process, a constitution states or ought to state not rules for the passing hour, but principles for an, for an expanding future. And that's what we have to do in America, I believe, expand the future. These things in terms of, I show you this terms, some of a rocky road to our constitutional development is that there were people who made the difference. And in my, the dean said it well, where my, I'm blessed to be in a courthouse built in 1858 as the United States Customs House. Uh, but I can look out my window and I see our state capitol that was designed by Thomas Jefferson. It's Greek revival, but Thomas Jefferson will make sure he gets his rotunda. So it's inside. He, it's Greek revival, but it has the rotunda in it. But I look at those, those resounding words, and then I look over beyond that. From my window, I see a statue to Barbara Johns, the young student in 1951 who had the courage to say, we're going to walk out of these schools in Moton High School because they're, not, they're very separate and very not unequal and walked out. So those are the people that made the change, and I see them in Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson. And, 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 and the words of Thurgood Marshall, his last, I think his last public speech before he died, he was receiving the Liberty Bell Award in Philadelphia uh, in front of Independence Hall. And he ended by saying, he said that the legal system can force open doors. And sometimes it can even knock down walls but it cannot build bridges. That job belongs to me and you. Let's work together. Let's take a chance on elevating and celebrating those things that we have in common and appreciating our differences and making this country what it was to be and doing that. And I end with this students, if the students are here, and not students. Story about a, a little girl who was in school and it was the day where people you're supposed to talk about, uh, well, let's say I'm ahead of myself. She was, she, her father was a lamp lighter, unskilled worker, and he was lighting the gas lamps in the little village. And she would sit on the hill and watch as her father would light all of the gas lamps at night, every night. And then, so they were in class about uh, about a month or so later, and they were saying, well, what do, your, what do your parents do? What do your father do, in a sense? And people would say, well, my father's a physician, or my father owns the bakery. And another person might say, well, my father's a whatever. And when they got to the little girl, she said, he, the teacher said, what does your father do? And she paused, and she said, my father punches holes in the dark. And that's what I think our mission is. The darkness and the morass of insensible thinking, divisive thinking, an idea that was somehow we are stuck in a 18th century document. No, the genius was it was an 18th century document, but it was written forever to be enduring. So punch holes in the dark, because that lets you know that the real existence is light. And the dark is just the fog that's enveloping us. But don't ever stop punching the holes in the dark. Thank you so much. That was really stirring and moving and uh, profound. So thank you for those words. Um, and I'm going to do a little Q&A, and then I'll open it up to uh, the audience for questions in a little while. So um, I wanted to start um, with the building bridges. Uh, that your maybe penultimate point and um, and how important that is and um, you know we talk a lot about that here and uh, I think aspire to do so here and I think the Fourth Circuit is famously known as a, a collegial place um, where uh, you all come down off the bench you shake hands with advocates you're collegial with one another um, and you've gone through some pretty serious 
change in who appointed the members of the Fourth Circuit. There was a time when it was very conservative. Now it's considered to be more liberal. Um, but my sense from what I know in the public is it remains a very collegial place and you continue to build those bridges. And I'm curious, having been on the court through that change and through all this time and been the chief judge of the court, how, how does that come about? What does the collegiality look like? What are, what are your thoughts about that? Well, building I, bridges on the fourth circuit. Well, I think first of all, what's good part about it is that uh, nothing happens in have, until you have at least one judge to agree with you. Uh, so in that, you, unlike a, a trial judge, you know, you can. It may not last long, but at the moment, this is the judgment <laughs> of the court. But you need that. So no, you, you have to be, and we we embrace that. Uh, that you, you work together, and the fourth circuit, we are very collegial and we work very independently too because we don't share bench memos, I mean memos that sort of give a brief idea of what the case is and that kind of thing. We don't share them. Uh, so the first time we hear each other's jurisprudential voices on a case is right there real time at oral argument. And the exchange can be very interesting. One of my favorite ones is, is that you, they ask you, Gene, a question and then you answer it and your answer is not quite like I would want it to be my point. And what I would say is this, I won't, uh, uh, you know, I'll look at you, but I'm talking to my colleague. But counsel, isn't your better response to that question? <laughs> I'm telling him or her what my view is of it. But we do so in a very respectful way in, in that sense. And we write letters, you sit out an opinion, and then someone will say, oh, Judge Gregory, thank you so much for your opinion. I really appreciate it. And then you get a 10 page letter saying, how much they have a different view. And what you do, you very kindly say, and you drop your other work. You, that's what about the Fourth Circuit. We're very polite in that sense. You don't just wait two or three weeks later. You respond, if you can, the next day or the same day. You say, thank you so much, Count, for your, your response. And like you alluded to, you weren't on the panel. But let me tell you a little bit more about the record in this case. That might give you a better perspective of how we came that way. So that, that keeps us engaged, it keeps you there. So you're always close to someone because that's the way we operate. You don't kind of distance like, yeah, I said it, I don't have to say anything else. No, it's not that because we believe that you get a strong and a better idea of justice by doing that in a very polite way. But we still had that, you know, you know and, and, and uh, if I was a chief and, and past July after seven years, but even though people, uh, new people came, everybody fell into that, because I, this is the way I analogize it, to make perspective. If you stand on the banks of a river, trillions of gallons or whatever, of, of gallons of water pass by, gone forever, never to return to that point of the river again. But guess what? The river never stops. You have to realize, no, you're just but an important part of it. You contribute to the river, but you are not the river. The river is the court. It's the institution. Just like our Constitution, that is the river. We contribute to it. And that's where I think it, it keeps us focused on it. And it's very good. One thing I'll say, I'll talk a little bit out of school, a little bit. It's fun. When I first got on the court, I'm on there with no law clerks because I was recess appointed. So I'm I like law school, so I'm, I'm ready, Dean, to you know, get going when it, get to my part of it, because I'm first, the baby judge goes first. So I got this. So I'm talking like, well, on that point, uh, I'll see it this way. But I could just, I could just hear these figures. Uh, <clears throat> judge Gregory, oh, how do you vote? You know, we, we can, <laughs> in our conferences, we can be quite brief. Uh, and that's why, you know, I, I joke, because sometimes you get those letters, especially with panel members. I can see people who weren't on the panel. I said, well, you know, I just to myself, this is like the bubble over your head. It'd been nice if we had said that at a conference. I think I could have saved myself a little. But, you know, but that's the fun part. And then you do that. But that's what it is. We work together. And that's what I think the whole point. In America, we don't have to be on the same page. Matter of fact, we're stronger because our views are different. But you can't walk out the room. You can't say the answer is separation. The answer is calling you an enemy and you have horns. No, you don't have horns. You're a human being like I am and I appreciate it, but come and let us talk and let's walk a little longer together. And maybe we might come to a consensus about what justice is. And we try to do that. And sometimes we don't, we have the sense and 
but it's a great, it's a, I think it's a great circuit. So when, uh, when you don't agree uh, and you end up dissenting, you know, uh, how do you think about dissenting? How often does it happen? Do you think for yourself or others, is it too often, not often enough? You know, it, it, how do you think about the whole practice? Well, as, as one person said, I think a dissent is the highest uh, expression of patriotism because you love it so much that you want it to be a better opinion. Not being disparaging about it, but a better opinion. And as long as that's what your focus is, uh, like uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, Abra Rabbi uh, Herschel, mm -hmm. Abraham, and he talks about, he said, once you start advocating, once you get angry, you're no longer advocating for justice or the law, you're advocating for yourself. And that's what, that's, that's what it is. So if a dissent is, is great, uh, immigration law, for example, I, I had a lot of dissents, a lot of dissents, but none of those dissents now, it's the, it's the, president, of the president of the court because I felt that it, it was necessary for justice in all respect to my clients, but I mean, my, 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 my colleagues, but um, a dissent well-purposed is important because it, nothing, it clarifies the majority and it also leaves room for what might become from a jurisprudential standpoint. But it, you know, I, don't, you know, I don't do it unnecessarily. Matter of fact, I have at least a couple of times had a majority, wrote the opinion, only happened a couple of times, I mind you, but a couple of times, <laughs> 23 years. But I said, you know what, after getting your dissent, I think you're right. And what, what you do, you write the majority. I have some suggestions of how you ought to tweak it and I'll join you and you write it because I think you have the better view. To me, that's what it's supposed to be. It's not hunkered down like, I don't care what you say. I tell my law clerks, if I get no response, that's the best applause you'll ever get because there, no is, there is no response. But a response that's well put and well reasoned ought to persuade you. You say that's what I, you know, they're open for persuasion. So that, that's the way I, the way I see it. And I, I love it. It's, like I said, it's a great colleagues and nothing I wouldn't do for any of my colleagues in terms of their personal thing. And, you know, in the course of I, I've had, to, as I alluded to, some, some difficult times in my life. Uh, my first wife passed. My colleagues were so wonderful and kind. And that's good. That's good. That's, that's good. It's a good court. Is there... Um a case or two that you wrote the majority for that you're particularly proud of or when you think about your legacy that you think that's that's what you want to be remembered for? Well, you know, I, you know, I, I don't, I guess I don't put it that way, but I, I can think of a case, I remember it took a long time for it to get this case out. It was a, it was a death case. Uh, and, uh, and it was, a lot of people end up writing, it took a while and finally we got it out and, the, um, and I urged that there was error in terms of the mitigating factors and, and, the, and, the, and the habeas. And we granted the writ and the man received a trial, a new trial, and he was sentenced to life. Um, another one I had was a death penalty case. I didn't write the opinion, but uh, another of my colleagues was on it. And he wrote a book. It was mentioned in a book called Anatomy of, Just Anatomy of Injustice. And what, what, it, did, what it was, it was, uh, first of the question was Atkins, uh, Atkins case in terms of whether or not he's mentally retarded. Mm -hmm. It turned out that he met the state's definition of it. So they said, okay, well, we, we, we'll, we'll agree that we had the red. They said, well, excuse me, wait a minute, we're not finished yet. There's also an issue of actual innocence. And we took that and we granted rid on the actual innocence. And after 17 years on death row, uh, he was released. And uh, it's like um, uh, Pasteur said, you know, he did work on rabies and he had never tested on a human being. And this lady, a mother whose son was, uh, had rabies, she said, please use it, please use it. He said, I never put it on a human being. She said, my son is going to die because nobody survives rabies. That vaccination to keep you from getting it, but only about two or three people ever. But anyway, the point is that he did it and the boy lived. And on his tombstone, that's all he wanted. And says, 
think the fellow's name was Joe or something. He lived. That's the only epitaph he wanted. That little boy lived. And you can live a life that, that the Constitution still lives. Just still alive. To me, that, that makes it important. So all the cases are important. But those are the ones that stand out a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is. I said this in your introduction, but I think you're manifesting it now. Uh, you know, the, you're a, an appellate judge. And I think we often think by the time cases get to the appellate level, they're kind of stripped a lot of the humanity in them. But you manage to continue to see that, right? You're talking yeah. about the effects on people's lives of, right. of the cases that you've done. Um, so uh, I don't know if this is related or not related, so I don't want to hem you in in your answer, but I do wonder if it's related. You know, you've talked in other contexts about your upbringing and your, your own um, life, and um, can you say a little bit about that and how has that affected your worldview as a judge? And uh, maybe is it part of why you have such empathy and humanity for the, the people whose cases you're deciding? Well, yeah, I think it is. I think it really is a lot with my parents. Uh, because they said they were people who worked hard, a lot of faith, and they poured in a lot of things. And it took me a while to understand some of the things that happened that had really connection with historical things, but I didn't know it at the time. Give you an example. This was early on when, you know, uh, blacks could use the dressing rooms in a department store to change clothes. Before that, you had to just buy clothes and hope that it fit, and it wouldn't be accepted on return. But anyway, my mom, I was a little kid, little boy, and I was there. She took me in a room with her, why? Because that's with nobody to watch me there. She wasn't gonna leave me unattended. And I came out with her, and this lady came out, and she was, she was uh, a Caucasian woman, and she said, ah, oh, there's a man back here, there's a man. You know what my mom did? The first thing she did was, she pushed me back and got between me and the lady between me and the world. She said, he's not a man, he's a little boy, and he's with me. I remember that, and I thought about it. You know what my mom was reacting to? Emmett Till. You know, the, you know, in Mississippi, he was supposedly whistling at someone. No, no, you're not gonna say my son is back here as a man in the ladies' dress room, and she stood up and said, no, he's a little boy, but she first put me behind her from between said, no, he is not. Those kind of sacrifices. And then the other is my mama, she was sub, she was she's a piece of work. Well, you know, would just give you anything weird, but she didn't, she was stand back. But when this when the factory integrated, black people then were in areas of the factory that they otherwise were not in. You know, a lot of because sometimes was in the stemmery and dealing with the raw tobacco, but in other words, this was in a more sophisticated machinery, they had, depend, they had to depend on white workers to train them when they were newly in those positions. And I remember Mr. Leroy, they had a time, you know, you know, a little slow on training her what she needed. I could think she'd come home and say, look, I tell you, I'm, I'm about tired of this now. <laughs> but you know, but the point, the good story is that she and Mr. Leroy became great friends. He'd bring vegetables over and that kind of thing. And I learned that there's space if you just keep and don't give up. If we just stop at that point, we'll never get to where we need to be. And so those things I just remember. And I remember my wife would tell you this too, like I don't care how bad a waitress is or waiter is at a restaurant. And most of them are very kind, but they're gonna get a nice tip from me. You know what, and I tell them, I don't even say it. You know, sometimes they're, not, they're short, but they still get a good tip. That's because my mom, when she was working at the tobacco, first tobacco factory after the war, they laid off the, all the women so the men could get their jobs. So then she was forced to go into domestic work. And then one time she worked at a restaurant. And I remember she worked overnight at this restaurant. And I would stand at the window waiting in the fog in the morning for her to get off from work. And I saw how hard she worked. And I said to myself, you getting this tip is not for you. You get this tip from my, from my my mom, but her influence over me is stronger than your rudeness, because that's important. So something has to be important and searing to you, and yeah. So that's the way I sort of grew up, church, and everybody, you know, family, and those kind of things. You you, you didn't you didn't uh, 
you, 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 you didn't lose your values and, and, and you're not that important. You're, you're humble. And just like this, this the medal, uh, it, it's, it's just amazing uh, to, to be in a position. And, and like I say, I accept it for all those people who smarter than I am, who I grew up with, who didn't. Uh, I'll give you an example, Dean. A friend of mine who spent most of his adult life in prison and substance abuse was his biggest problem. And he's doing well now, but I, as a Fourth Circuit judge, I went to his chip ceremony. Where you get your chip and he graduated to another level. I didn't come as a Fourth Circuit judge. I came as a friend. And that's, a point, that's something I guess my colleague would never even think about. But there's no mantle that I wear that would keep me from that thing that touches me to a person improving themselves, getting out of prison, and now he goes back and he helps other people through the journey. He said, I know what it's like to be addicted to drugs and let me help you. And he does that now. And even to the point now from diabetes, he's almost blind, just about blind, legally well blind. And he said, I've never seen clear in my life than I see now today. And that's how we got to see the Constitution, not with just eyes of just a way to find out to beat people down, but eyes that can see clear away from drugs, away from imprisonment. Those things are important to me and to a lot of people. 